Let me start off this morning by reading from John chapter 5, which is the chapter we're looking at today in our series on John. So John chapter 5, reading from verse 1 to verse 15. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralysed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured and he picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something else worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Lord, as we look at this passage today, I ask that the message you want for us to hear will come from these words. And that we will see you glorified in all that you've done. I ask this in your name. Amen. So... There was a pool that was filled with water located just outside of Jerusalem at the eastern gate called the Sheep's Gate. The pool of Bethesda was used in ancient times to provide water for the temple. But for years, sceptics claimed that this pool didn't exist. They had no idea where it was. They thought it was actually made up. And it wasn't until the 19th century um, that when they found the pool, that they realised actually what John was saying was true. In the late 1800s, there was an excavation um, that took place near a church near Jerusalem, and they found the pool exactly where the Apostle John said it was. So we now know the pool existed. And in fact, there's quite a few of us from our fellowship here, including myself and Sal, who have actually stood at this pool earlier this year when we were in the Middle East. But how did it get a reputation as a healing pool? How did that happen? Well, John doesn't actually go into it, so this is how I think it may have happened. I do believe that the waters were troubled, or they vibrated, or something happened, and it caught the imagination of the people around. Whatever it was, something wasn't normal at this particular pool. And when I was looking at this passage, I never realised that depending on which version of the Bible that you will read will depend on whether or not you get the mysterious verse 4. Because some versions do not have verse 4. So if you look at the NIV, ESV, ASV, Message, CEB and all sorts of other ones, they don't have verse 4. But in like versions like the New King James Version, it has... Verse 4, which is, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after stirring up of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. Why do some versions not have verse 4? The only answer I can give you is that a lot of scholars believe that people put verse 4 in after John wrote the gospel so that they could explain why the waters were troubled 
some people believe that John didn't put it in because that wasn't the main thing. That wasn't the thing that was, he was the message he was trying to put across. Does it matter? No. Something special happened there, and that's what the point is. So, possibly, one day, someone said that they heard something about the waters being troubled. So they stepped into the water and they were healed. <coughs> Word spread. And then possibly, someone else said that their second cousin on their mother's side stood in the water and that they were healed. And then another, and then a rumour spread. And suddenly you had the place filled with people who were sick, wanting to be healed. That may sound cynical on my part. And don't get me wrong, God may have used those waters to heal people. That is not in question here. We just don't know how or why. So people began crowding around the pool. And then people may or may not have been healed. So they're trying to work out why. We weren't getting healed. And then someone said, well, you've got to be first to get in. And so therefore then, people crowded around more and then pushed and shoved and did whatever they did so that they were first to get in the water. If they weren't healed, they must have thought, well, I wasn't first, I'm going to try harder next time. So that's the sort of setting that was there when Jesus arrived. All these people crammed in waiting, watching this water to make sure that they're first in. And he comes along, Jesus comes along and changes the life of the paralytic man forever. He picks up his mat and walks after 38 years. So here's Jesus at the pool. There's hundreds of people there. But he doesn't heal hundreds of people. He heals one person at the back. And it makes me wonder why this was the case. I mean, as we know, Jesus healed lots of people in his ministry. And as you look in the Gospels, there's passages all over the place where it talks about people flocking and crowding and pushing and shoving so that they could be healed by Jesus. Even in the very next chapter of John, in chapter 6, verse 2, it says, And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he performed on the sick. But not here. Not at this pool. Why? They had no idea who he was. They didn't have a clue. He walked in and he would have been just like any other person. Even the paralytic guy who was healed, when, the, when he was questioned, they said, who healed you? He goes, I have no idea. And he's gone. So I can't tell you. So what's Jesus doing at the pool? I think that he's intentionally stirring things up. Not the waters. <laughs> Someone got it. <laughs> I have a theory that if you want to get noticed, you're either going to do something really, really bad or really, really good. And if you do that, then people will know you by your first name. And I think that's exactly what Jesus did. He came into this setting. He's wanting to... Is at the start of his ministry. He's wanting people to get to know him. So he spots an opportunity to be a very, very bad man in the eyes of the Jewish leaders. And because of that, everybody got to know who he was. So when Jesus heals a man, he says to him, pick up your mat and walk. He could have simply said, get up and walk, but he didn't. He said, pick up your mat and walk. And what's the issue with this? Because it's the Sabbath, and no one is allowed to work on the Sabbath, the Pharisees had a whole list of things that you can and can't do. And obviously on that list is you're not allowed to carry your mat, because that is considered work. And I think that at times our society is becoming so politically correct that we're afraid of stirring things up, that we're afraid of making people get to notice us because we're worried about being labelled or having negative comments put against us or being brought before the anti-discrimination anything 
because of wanting to stand up for the truth. Paul says in Romans, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. We're the ones that need to stand out because of the truth. We need to stir things up at times. And that's just what Jesus did. Apparently, you can't pick up your mat on the Sabbath. And I must admit, in days gone by, I would find it hard to believe that people would be like this. But having experienced some of this personally in Israel this year, I can quite believe this is what the Pharisees were like. A couple of examples. We are at a restaurant at the start of the Sabbath in Israel. And someone obviously didn't like the food that they had just eaten because they deposited it on the floor in front of the elevator on that Friday night. And that stayed there the whole night and the next day because you're not allowed to clean because that's work. Doc got into trouble at breakfast on Saturday morning because he wanted a piece of toast. So he turned the toaster on to put the bread in and they come straight over him. No, 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 that is work. I'm not allowed to do that. <laughs> True story. Do you know that pushing a button in an elevator to go from floor to floor is also considered work? So on the Sabbath, when you get in the elevator, it will stop at every single floor. It doesn't matter whether or not you want to get in it or not because you're not allowed to do work. And this is today. So you can imagine what they were like back then and the, the controversy that was caused by Jesus telling this guy to pick up his mat and walk. So Jesus now had their attention completely. And then he starts to preach, which is what the next half of the chapter of John 5 is. He introduces himself to the crowd and he clearly implies to them that he's divine. So in John 5 verse 18, Jesus says, um, uh, John 5 tells us that the crowd who listened to him became angry because he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now he had their attention. Jesus made it clear that the only way anyone would have eternal life was by believing in him, which is in verse 24 and 25. Now all of this obviously didn't go down well with his audience. And they're saying, who is this person? Who speaks like this? What authority does he have and claim to so that he can say this? So... The other part of the chapter of John 5 is Jesus giving his credentials to those who are listening to prove that he was who he was. Because from Moses' day onwards, the testimony of two or three witnesses was required for a matter to be decided. So it couldn't just be decided by one person saying this is so. It had to have two or three witnesses to back it up. So in John... He shares about how when Jesus shares not two, not three, but four witnesses to prove the claim that he was who he was. His first witness, he said, was John the Baptist. So in verse 33, he said, you have sent to John and he has testified to the, to the truth. And then he adds weight to that of what happened with John. Because he says, for the very work that the Father has given me to finish and which I am doing, testifies that the Father has sent me, which is in verse 36. What's some of the work the Father has sent Jesus to finish? Well, exhibit once stood before them, the man who was healed from being a paralytic. But wait, there's more. In verse 37, the Father who sent me has, ordered him, has himself testified concerning me. And so what Jesus is saying there is, Remember when I was baptised, the heavens opened up, the Spirit came down in the form of a dove, and people heard my Father declaring that this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And then Jesus finishes off with the biggest, <coughs> the biggest um, weight of evidence to prove who he was. He says in verse 39, you diligently study the scriptures 
because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. So what he's talking about here is all those prophecies that you know intimately because you have studied the scriptures. I am the fulfillment of these prophecies. You cannot get away from that. And that is why I can say I am who I am. So, that's chapter 5, shrunk down. But what does it mean to us? It's all very good talking about Sabbaths and laws and pools and water and all these sorts of things like that. But what is God telling us? The name of the pool, Bethesda, translate in Aramaic to house of mercy. But I believe that pool was no longer a house of mercy. It was now a house of merit. Let me explain. Listen to the message that what everybody was hearing at the pool at the time. You need to position yourself at the front. It's only if you position yourself where you need to be where you'll be blessed. Therefore, blessing will only flow by putting yourself first above everyone else. And that, if you are healed, it's only because you deserve this by the fact that you were first in line. So it's no longer a house of mercy where people come to be healed. It's now an area where people are focusing just on themselves and not helping anyone else because they are the ones who want to be first into the pool. Blessing is now based upon merit, whether or not you are number one or not. And the fact everyone was so focused on themselves that they didn't recognise Jesus in their midst. Everyone positioned themselves out front, missed out on the blessing, because where did Jesus go? He went to the back, to the one who'd been there probably the longest. If we spend our time trying to our, improve our position before God, trying to improve our chances for receiving blessings, putting ourselves above others, then we will be the ones that miss out. Are we a house of mercy or are we a house of merit? It's a question I think we need to ask ourselves. I put up on Facebook from one of my readings the other day that Reverend John Stott once, once wrote, I was hungry and you formed a humanities club and discussed my hunger. I was in prison and you crept off quietly to your chapel in the cellar and prayed for my release. I was naked, and in your mind you debated the morality of my appearance. I was sick, and you knelt and thanked God for your health. I was homeless, and you preached to me about the spiritual shelter of the love of God. I was lonely, and you left me alone to pray for me. Christian, you seem so holy, so close to God, but I'm still very hungry and lonely and cold. Are we a house of mercy or merit? We do need to remember that the man who was physically healed by Jesus still needed spiritual healing as well. That's part and parcel of the package. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Now stop sinning, or something else worse may happen to you. What was his sin? We don't know. We don't know. But the spiritual part of his life had to also be healed, not just the physical. I think some fellowships focus more on the healing of the physical, and some fellowships focus more on the spiritual fellowship. Uh, spiritual healing, I'm sorry. We need to be a balance of both. We can't neglect one without the other. Another thing that stood out for me in this passage was the reaction of the Jewish leaders when Jesus arrived. They had no idea who he was, and so they were questioning, they were finding out. But the thing was, no matter how much proof 
God provides, there will still be people who refuse to see that truth. Jesus was a bona fide miracle worker. But the religious leaders couldn't see the miracle. They were blinded by the fact that they were upset because he violated a rule on the Sabbath to tell a man to pick up his hat. That became their focus. That became their focal. That's all they worried about. Not the miracle that had happened. So a blessing that was meant to increase the faith of the people around them only increased the blindness of those who refused to acknowledge that blessing. The walls went up. The anger started. That's when it all started. Last week, we had nearly 20 unchurched teens in our service. And I must say that I was very proud of how everybody here welcomed them with open arms. Most of these kids had never stepped into church, let alone participated in a church service. So I do believe it's a genuine miracle that they were here in the first place. Some of these kids were rough, really rough. But they occupied the first two or three rows of our service last week. Because they were late, otherwise they would love to have been down the back. But they were up the front and they behaved themselves and they participated in the service the whole way through. You could see that communion was very new to most of them. I was watching them and smiling inside because they're sniffing, because I'd said the word wine, something they started sniffing to see. Is it? Is it? <laughs> um, one girl, she took a bite of the bread and screwed the face up so badly. Oh, it's disgusting. So she grabbed the chocolate milk and gave a big swig to wash down the bread. They didn't know what it was all about. But my hope is the seeds that were sown, in, not just in that service, but on the weekend and the upper courses and things like that, will create discussions with their leaders and that they will be, be brought close to Christ because of this. My point is, if I had chosen to be upset by how they, how they spoke, how their behaviour was, if I had chosen to make it an issue, the fact that they didn't know what was happening with communion, but they all took the emblems anyway. If I had made that the focal point and got angry about that, I would have missed the blessing and the miracle of these kids being in the service and what God is doing in their lives. I was part of a church that the youth pastor was almost, by this much, sacked because when they had the communion service at night, he chose to take it away from them, tell everybody, don't have communion here, we'll do it in the back room so people will be able to, to share and talk. And because he moved the service, communion service from that, that area, the leaders of the church were going to sack him because you can't do that. The focal point was of what they saw was a tradition and a rule more than the blessing of the kids sharing communion together. Are we a house of mercy or a house of merit? My hope is that we will never follow the example of those waiting at the pool, trying to be first, but instead we'll follow the examples of Christ, who dared to stir things.